Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church's Sunday morning worship online. I'm Pastor Brett, and whether you are a regular part of our church family or this is the first time you've tuned in, we are thrilled to have you with us this day. We are, of course, still in the midst of the corona quarantine, and, and so everybody's weeks are probably similar as they have been in the past. But there has been some encouraging news here the last few days. Uh, we have heard that the, the number of new cases is beginning to, to taper off. We've heard some news just in the last day or so that they might actually have some kind of medication that would prove to be a treatment. Um, they're even thinking now that the vaccine for this virus might be accelerated in its distribution, although that's still quite a ways off. And yet, despite all of the good news, and we are grateful for that, as well as those that have labored to bring that about, we know that ultimately our hope rests in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. He is our rock. He is our foundation. He is the source of our faith. And so it's him that we have come to worship this day. We're going to do that through music. We're going to do that through prayer in just a moment. We're going to do that as we uh, look to God's word and then as we conclude our service in a time around the Lord's table. But it's our hope that as we go through these things, that all that we do uh, will be found pleasing to God's sight, just as it is our hope that it will be invigorating and rejuvenating to us. We're going to begin our time this morning uh, by going to God in a time of prayer. Uh, before you, I ask you to bow with me, I would um, encourage you to remember beyond today the Fry family. A longtime member of our church, Leonard Fry, passed away this, this uh, previous week. To the best of my knowledge, uh, Leonard had, I think, the longest tenure of membership of those still alive at Calvary Baptist. And besides that, he was just a good guy. And so he's going to be missed. Um, we know that he's with his wife. We know that he's with Jesus. Uh, but it still leaves an absence, especially for family. And in these days, it's difficult for family to be able to go about the grieving process or to celebrate life in the ways that they'd like. So please continue to remember them in your prayers uh, long after our service this morning. With that, let me invite you, if you would, to please bow with me as we spend a few moments in prayer this day. Almighty Father, how we thank you for uh, this day and the opportunity to come before you. As always, we are in awe, God, that you uh, want to hear our voice to, to spend time and fellowship with us. And yet, we know that you do. And so we bring before you, uh, Lord, uh, those things that weigh on our hearts. We do think of Len this day and of his family as they grieve the passing of dad and granddad. For those others of us, Lord, a friend and fellow church member. What a rich and well-lived life, and we are grateful for that, but there still is a void that remains, and so we ask God that in a special way you might uh, provide comfort, especially for the family as they're not able to um, grieve in the manner that we traditionally do here in this country. Lord, we think of Anne, um, who continues to struggle with, with pneumonia, and I've lost count how many times she's had to wrestle with this. I think it's the fourth, maybe even the fifth. And so I pray, Lord, that as she comes off uh, the antibiotics one more time, that this would be the round that does the trick. We pray, Lord, that you would enhance whatever has happened with the medication, that you would touch her divinely and supernaturally so that she doesn't have to worry about uh, the pneumonia anymore and can just go on uh, resuming life as it was before uh, she started down this path of illness. Father, we think of uh, a friend of one of our members, of Lola and Oscar, a previous pastor of theirs. Um, his wife, Shirley, um, has been diagnosed with cancer, both in the kidney and the pancreas. Lord, I'm not sure where things are at in terms of surgery, as I know a lot of those have been delayed. Um, but we know that even without surgery, you can intervene. And so we ask that you would do that. Lord, whether it be to help through uh, chemotherapy or radiation treatments, or Lord, whether it be just through a supernatural touch of your hand, but we pray that your healing presence would be with her. We think of others, Lord, uh, that have been impacted by this virus. Uh, we think of um, 
pastors and teachers in, in distant lands. Father, whose income is based on uh, the work that they do, and when they're not able to work, that uh, means there's no source of income coming in. And so we pray that you would provide, that you would be the source of provision uh, for them, that you would sustain them as your people. Father, we think of our national leaders as they contemplate um, kind of moving us out of the quarantine status. We know that that's going to be a process. Uh, but we pray for wisdom as they uh, think about the various options with that. We think of those, Lord, uh, still that are on the front lines of, of providing care, whether that be hospital workers or first responders or um, medical staff or those in uh, nursing home facilities. Uh, God, may your hand of uh, protection rest upon them. And, and then finally, Lord, for those um, whose lives have been upended by this, whether it's because they got severely sick, maybe even hospitalized, or, Lord, in, in some cases have lost loved ones, may you be with them. God, you are an incredible God, able to do that which no man can do. And so we ask that you would be present in their lives in the ways that you alone are capable of. Again, Father, how we thank you just for this opportunity to come to you. And we praise you not only for what you do, but Father, for who you are this day. And we ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
demands my soul. My life, my. As we think about the cross, I think we forget, especially when we find ourselves in the midst of the time that we are, that Easter was just a few weeks ago. We're really in the afterglow of that. In fact, had we been alive uh, some 2,000 years ago, Jesus would still be upon the earth, Scripture tells us, teaching and ministering to people before ascending to the Father on high. And yet even in Jesus' day, right after that would have happened, he told his disciples that it was important that they remember. That they remember the sacrifice that was made out of love for them. And so we do that again today. This morning as we have the elements before us, we are reminded of the depth of love that Jesus had for us as his followers so significant that, as the bread reminds us, he was willing to sacrifice his body, to allow the nails to be driven through his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns thrust on his skull, the beating and flogging that occurred, the, the spear that was thrust into his side, all of that out of love for us so that a provision could be made not for his sins, but for ours. In the same way, we think of the cup that reminds us of the blood that was shed, the blood that flowed from all of those wounds. And in so doing, allows us to enter into God's presence. This morning, as we take the elements, God's word tells us that we're to do so with hearts right before him. And so I'm going to pause in a word of prayer just briefly. Uh, to ask that God would do that very thing in our hearts. And so we, before we take the bread and the cup, would you bow with me for just a moment? Father, your word tells us that we're uh, to come to the table with hearts that are right before you. And yet we know um, that that's not always the condition of, of where we're at. Sometimes, Lord, we have done things or said things or thought things that are contrary to your will. And as you bring those to mind, even at this uh, particular moment, we pray your forgiveness, Father, and we repent. And we ask for strength in the days ahead not to repeat those things. In the same way, uh, on, on occasion, our, our sin is not one of, of commission, but omission because we've missed opportunities that you've provided Opportunities to care and minister to others, opportunities to share the good news uh, of your son, opportunities, Father, uh, to be your present in the lives of those that are in need. And so forgive us of that. Father, we repent and ask that in the future you would give us boldness and courage to do those things that you would call us to do. May your hand be upon the taking of these elements now, and we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we look to Scripture, we're given an instruction of that very first Lord's table. And we read how Jesus, when he had taken a loaf of bread, he broke it. He gave thanks, and then he said these words to them then and to us now. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this whenever you eat it in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. In the same way, we're told in God's word that at the conclusion of that meal, Jesus took a cup, gave thanks, and said these words. This cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us drink together.
Amen. I wanted to let you know of something special that we are going to be doing this coming Saturday. Now, a week from today is Mother's Day. Normally, we would find ways to celebrate that with some cute videos or a little gift that we can give to moms. We're not able to do that in the normal fashion. But that doesn't mean we don't want to give you a gift. And so moms, here's the offer we would like to, to make available to you. Next Saturday, which is the day before Mother's Day, uh, I'm going to be at the church, maybe a couple others joining me, with flowers, uh, a few chocolates, um, and we're going to do a drive-by Mother's Day celebration. However, it's not just for moms. It's for moms, it's for wives, it's for all women in our church. And so if you're a female, we invite you to come next Saturday uh, between 10.30 and noon. It'll just be drive-by through the uh, the parking lot of Calvary Baptist. It'll be a chance for me uh, to say hi and uh, wish you a happy Mother's Day as well as perhaps to see some others that might be driving through as well. Again, next Saturday between 10.30 and noon, we invite you to come and have a, a little bit early Mother's Day celebration on us. Well, you notice it's a little bit different setting uh, for our sermon time this morning. Um, I decided that it might be kind of fun for us to actually use the church as the, the prop to drive some of the points I wanted to make with you this day. I also thought it might be uh, kind of fun just to remind you what your church looks like. It's been several weeks since we've had a chance to gather together, so we're going to uh, stop at different places around the church uh, just as sort of a refresher to you. But I wanted to begin outside the church with an opportunity to uh, look at the brick behind me. This is the oldest part of the church. Uh, this is a church that was founded back on Easter Sunday in 1928. Ten years later, in November of 1938, uh, they uh, commemorated the opening of the church, and so it's 80 plus years old. And as you look at it, as you see the brick, it's still pretty strong. It's still steadfast, which is a great reminder to us of the church. We're in uh, sort of crazy times, and yet we know that the church is always going to be there. In fact, Jesus Christ himself uh, told us uh, that uh, even the very gates of hell itself will not prevail uh, against God's church. And so, whether there's an uh, earthquake, the church is going to prevail. Whether there's a flood, the church is going to prevail. Whether there's a, a financial crisis or another pandemic or a, a citywide fire or a blizzard, it doesn't matter. The church will prevail. Now, maybe not this particular structure, but the church with a big C is always going to be there. And as we think about what it means to be a, a follower of Christ, as we think about what it means uh, to worship with him, I think one of the important concepts that we not lose sight of, especially in times of crisis like this, is that the church is there and will always be there for us as a part of, as an extension of the very body of Christ. Well, when we think about the church and we think about opportunities to, to come into the church, we normally think of coming into the entrance. And so we're going to take a moment and head that direction. So follow me and we're going to find ourselves at the church entrance in just a moment. So we find ourselves at the entrance uh, to the church. I suspect this is a place that all of you are familiar with. It's the thing that greets us. And I wanted to stop here as a reminder when we think about our relationship with God, as we think about uh, the time we spend in worship, uh, that we're always welcome into God's house. Now, uh, circumstances are a little bit different at this particular time. Uh, in fact, probably for the first time in the history of our church and all churches around our country, the doors are locked on Sunday mornings over the course of, of several weeks. But we know that is going to change. And even if the doors of the church are locked, we know that we're still welcome <clears throat> because we're never locked out of God's presence. The Holy Spirit is always at work and alive within us. And so there's always that sense of, of invitation. In fact, we, we think of that passage uh, from the book of Revelations that's known so well from the, the third chapter, the 20th verse, that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whoever hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in with him and will dine with him and he with me. 
And so we have that image of Jesus constantly being there for us, knocking at the door. And, and as soon as we open it, he's ready to have us come in. Now, for us, that kind of happens on two levels. And in one way, we think of that, that entrance being where we do it for the first time and then Christ is a part of our lives throughout eternity. But there's a second occasion in which I think we have to continue to invite Christ into our lives. It's sort of that process of, of sanctification where each and every day we allow God to come in and, and take more and more control of us. And so I know for at least myself, every day I pray that the Holy Spirit will come and will fill me from the, the top of my head to the very bottom of my feet in the hope and the prayer that I can live out those, those same words that John the Baptist uttered so long ago when he said, he must become greater as I become less. That's not just my hope, I suspect, but yours as well. And so as we, again, think about what it means to be a, a part of the church, we're reminded of the fact that we are welcome by God, always with him there at the door knocking, so long as we allow him to come into our lives. But nobody comes to the church just to stand at the door. Uh, there's a place where we uh, want to get to as well. And so we're going to head into the sanctuary or the worship center. So come along and follow me as we move there. So here we are in the sanctuary or the worship center as we sometimes refer to it. And uh, while we know that God is with us all of the time, I think there's the hope, maybe even the expectation, that something special will happen in this room. It's kind of like the passage where we read in Scripture that we're two or three or more gathered together. God's there in their midst. We know that he's there all of the time, but there's something unique about a gathering. And so we, we sort of sense, anticipate that God is going to be present with us in a special way uh, when we're in this room. And as I've been sitting here, it's, it's kind of interesting that, that I see that a number of the components that, that really drive this time together in, in the worship center are really within the reach of the people uh, there in the pews. I never had thought about that prior. But for example, there's, there's the hymn book. Now, I know that we don't use these as often as some in our church would like, but whether it's the hymnal or whether it's the, the words up on the screen as a part of our, of our time in the services, all of these things serve to uh, draw us, I think, into God's presence in, in a special way. I think of the passage in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, that says this, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And then that's what we're doing with our lips. We're singing, we're lifting up the fruit of our lips to God as we sing those praises to him. You know, for nearly as, as long as we can look back in the history of our faith, we see that unique place and role that music has had in our life as worshipers. We go back to the book of Exodus and we read of Moses leading the Israelites in songs of praise as they came out of bondage under Pharaoh. And we go to the exact opposite end of scripture all the way to, uh, to Revelation and we read of, of the, the singing that's there before the throne and, and with the elders in, in presence. And so we see that there's just something unique and wonderful about uh, lifting up to God our voices in, in song. There's just something that, that the spoken word just doesn't quite capture. But there's other things that, that are in front of me. I, I see, for example, here are our prayer cards. Now, we always appreciate when you do the registration part of it as well, but, but what's of much more concern to me is, is what's on the back. And, and you have there a place where you can put down prayer request needs that you might have. One of the things that's central to our, our life here at, at Calvary is prayer, and we, we do it all the time. We do it as a part of our worship services. We do it in our Bible studies. We do it in our Sunday school classes. Uh, we do it in, uh, in our men's coffee time on Thursdays. We do it in our council meetings. It's just sort of interwoven, intertwined into every aspect of who we are as a church because we know that it's important. In the Gospel of Luke, the 18th chapter, the first verse we read, and he told them a parable, it's the parable of the persistent widow. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. 
ought always to pray. We are constantly to be a people of prayer. And so God wants to hear our joys, our hardships, our praises, our, our struggles. He wants to hear those, those things uh, lifted before him. Not that he doesn't already know them. But he knows that the building of any relationship requires communication. And so he wants us uh, to bring these to him as we, as we strengthen our walk with him. There's another piece uh, that's here, and, and this is the, uh, the offering envelope. Now, as we look at this, um, what it really is is a tangible tool to allow us to express our gratitude to God. It's a way of acknowledging uh, really the role that he has in our life, whether it's number one or whether it's 538. We know, as Jesus has shared with us in, in Matthew 6, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so it's not that God needs our money, he doesn't. It's that we need to give in order to express our appreciation and acknowledging that he is the source of all good things, as well as to signify the, the role and position that he has in our lives. And then as I glance, there's, there's one more item, and certainly maybe the last that I'm mentioning, but not the least, and, and that's God's word, the, the Bible. In the book of Colossians, the, the third chapter, the 16th verse, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You know, as we take time to, to look at this book on Sunday mornings, and I'm sure as a part of your weekday life as well, we expose ourselves to the truths and, and, and the insights that God's Word contains. We allow those to, to percolate or ruminate a little bit uh, within us so that we can gain a deeper insight of who God is and who He desires to be in our lives. And that's an important part. We need to have that, that knowledge base, that understanding of God. But that's only half of the equation. There's another part that goes uh, along with that, and that's uh, summed up for us in, in the words that we find in James 1.22, where it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, or you end up deceiving yourselves. Now, how is it that, that being exposed to God's word or reading God's word uh, ends up deceiving us? Well, the deception comes in when we believe that, that just having the knowledge, just having the understanding, just having read the words, just owning a Bible is adequate and sufficient. It's a great start for us. But what God calls us to is, is to take these words, take these insights, these truths that we find, and put them into practice, to integrate them into our, our lives as, as followers of Jesus. What we end up finding is that this book serves as what God intended to be, a guidebook, a playbook, an owner's manual for us, giving us all the direction, all of the instruction, all of the insight that we need to live as the people that he has called us to be. So we see that there's a lot of different things that take place as a, a part of our worship on Sunday mornings here in the sanctuary. And, and for some people, you may be thinking, whew, sermon's almost done. Well, not quite. There are two more pieces that I, I want to make reference to. The next one is what happens in the sunroom. And so come along with me as we make a, a stop there in just a moment. So we find ourselves here in what we refer to as the sunroom. It's kind of a takeoff or play on words. It's sunroom, S-O-N, room. Uh, but if you're familiar with it at all, you know it's the room in the church that has the most windows. So it also provides the greatest exposure to sunlight on those days in Oregon when we actually have sunlight. For us, this is the place that we gather typically after the service uh, for some fellowship. And, and the truth is that fellowship is not just uh, something that we do because we, uh, we like to, to be in one another's presence. It's an important part of the life of the church, of being in relationship uh, with God. I'm standing in front of a table here that normally on a typical Sunday would be filled with coffee containers and, and some tea holders over on a table across the way would, would be where the cookies are. And I'm so grateful to Bev and to Virginia and to Ted for, for doing all the works that they do to get those things ready. And as much as we love the coffee and as much as we love the tea and, and the cookies, the, the reality is, is that the fellowship is not about cookies and coffee. It's about sharing our lives with one another. 
In the book of 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verse 11, we read these words, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We find ourselves in an interesting season with the, the coronavirus, and, and I think we're all aware of that. But, but even before this event, I think most of us realized that we're living in increasingly challenging times. What used to be uh, bastions of stability for us uh, just don't seem to be there anymore. We are increasingly finding ourselves in, in, in periods of financial uncertainty or, or job uncertainty or as this uh, virus has revealed to us, health uncertainty. That's why it's so important, so critical <clears throat> that we have one another to encourage and to stand beside one another to, in normal times, to be able to put our, our arms around one another, to pray and be there, to laugh when the, the things are going well in life, and to weep when we go through those difficult moments. We need these, just as we need one another. And that's why fellowship is so essential for us as a, as a body of believers. Now, uh, living and learning God's Word, those are foundational to our faith. We, we can't exist as disciples without those things. But if there's no relationship with one another, then what we find is, is that the church is, is always going to fail to be all that it was intended to be, all that I think we would want it to be. Well, we are pretty much uh, done with one exception. There's just one more stop that we have in our, our little time together around the church, and that is the exit. So follow me as we uh, make our way just before we leave this morning. Well, good. I'm glad you made it out of the sunroom with me. You know, for a lot of people think that when the fellowship part's done, then a church is over, but there really is one more critical piece, and it follows the instructions that Jesus gave us in uh, Matthew 28, where he gave to us these words, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all of the things that I have commanded you. Uh, we read here that, that part of what is necessary for us is to get outside the walls of the church. We love our church. It's uh, great to be around one another. We are so looking forward to, to having a chance to get back together. And yet, where we're at even now is a big part of what God has called us to. So we see that he, he calls us to go, which means that as much as we love it inside the church, that's not where we're supposed to end up. And the truth be told, we realize that fewer and fewer people are coming in through the doors of the church. If we're wanting to have the impact of the kingdom that God calls us to have, to, to make a difference for his name's sake, uh, we're going to have to go to the people rather than expecting them to come to us. And then he says that we're to make disciples. Now, I, I, I think that there's disciple making that takes place within the boundaries of the church. It happens when we're together with Sunday school and for Bible studies, for prayer gatherings, for our worship service and, and other things. But again, uh, disciple making in today's age isn't going to happen probably in the classrooms of Calvary Baptist. It's going to happen in the workplaces. And as we get together and talk with family members about what Jesus means to us or, or, or have a conversation over the fence with our neighbor, God calls us to go and to make disciples. And so my hope is that as we move beyond uh, this uh, worship time this morning, as we move back into uh, the, the corona quarantine that we find ourselves, that rather than seeing this as a limitation to our faith, maybe God's opened some doors for us. Uh, maybe he's forced us to take that step that he wants us to take and uh, to get out into the world and to be his witnesses for Jesus Christ. Again, we thank you for joining with us this morning. Uh, I'm going to ask a blessing over you in just a moment, but then we're going to wrap up with a song, so uh, don't turn things off too quickly. Um, this is a good, fast song that reminds us of the importance of loving God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind and all of our strength. And so with that, may God's hand rest upon you. May his peace uh, reign over you this coming week, and may he use you and me 
as ambassadors uh, for the work of his kingdom. For these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.